Okay, good morning, uh, good afternoon, or good evening, uh, depending on where you are in the world. Um, we will get started. I think a few more people will probably join us as we carry on, but um, as is the, the nature of events that are global, we have people uh, joining at all different time zones. So um, I, will, I will just start off with a quick introduction to what we're going to do today, um, and then we will get into um, the more exciting part of the event. So my name is Sarah Kachansky. I'm the Open Finance Community Lead for Chorus, among many other things. Um, this is one hat I wear. Um, the Open Finance Community is a new community to Chorus. We uh, only launched towards the end of last year. Um, we are designed to uh, engage bankers, insurers, tech players in the world of open finance, along with uh, startups, fintechs, insurtechs help them all get together, help them all collaborate and learn from each other. And um, so that's our purpose here at the Open Finance Community. Um, as part of what we do and as part of that engagement, we run a series of challenges uh, where we encourage startups um, in various areas and uh, various segments of open finance to apply, um, to join us to win various prizes from ourselves and our partner Capgemini. And the idea is to recognize really the most innovative companies um, in, in various segments of, of the finance world. So today we're going to be looking at InsureTech. Um, this is an exciting new world for us. Um, I should point out that this is uh, the second of our challenges that we've run. So um, we're still learning our way through this, but hopefully you will enjoy today's event. Um, we've got some great guest speakers coming up. Um, we're also looking forward to finding out the winners um, as we go through today's ceremony. So do stick with us because the most exciting announcement as always will come at the end when we reveal our gold winner. Um, I would say um, just up front and, and, you know, further, I will repeat this at the end, but if you do have any suggestions or feedback for, for how the event went, anything you'd like to see more of, maybe anything you'd like to say less of, um, possibly feel free to say me if that's the case, um, do let us know and we will put some contact details at the end, but we're always trying to make these as, as good and as better, um, make them as improvement as we go along to make them as good as possible for you, our audience. So do please feel, to give, feel free to give us keep feedback. Now, um, I'm going to welcome Luca Roussignon, Head of Insurance at Cap Capgemini. Luca is an insurance strategy professional has, who has over 12 years of experience within the insurance industry. He's currently leading the insurance market intelligence team at Capgemini, and he's looking after thought leadership development for insurance and insure tech alike. So um, over to you, Luca, please. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. I was just trying to amuse myself, as always. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Yes, uh, that's uh, that's my background in, uh, in a nutshell. So what do we do in uh, in uh, in my team? Uh, well, I'm responsible for all the uh, thought leadership and for identifying upcoming um, innovation trends uh, and opportunities for for insurers and within the wider uh, insurance ecosystem, which is which is why I'm here today. Um, Today's, today's competition recognizes and rewards the most innovative insure tech, and uh, as many of you will know, is, is powered by Fintech Visor, a global platform developed by Capgemini and the course that enables Fintech, insure tech, uh, and uh, to showcase their solutions and empower um, you with an interactive uh, matchmaking tool to foster new valuable partnerships with the uh, financial institution. I had an opportunity to go through the nominations of many participants, and I was genuinely impressed by the variety, ingenuity, and value added of these ideas. Uh, from well-being to no-code platforms, from distribution solutions to investment, we have some great, great finalists, uh, many of which I had an opportunity to interact with uh, in the past. And I want to thank you all again for for joining us uh, for this for this competition. Uh, at Capgemini, at Capgemini, we have been focusing on unlocking the power of innovation for a number of years. We had uh, uh, dedicated uh, uh, practices for fintech and insurtech for uh, several years, um, as well as a dedicated venture capitalist uh, uh, fund for uh, for investment. Of course, the last year has been uh, uh, has been harder between lower valuations, higher interest rates, the recent. Uh, collapse of Silicon Valley Bank, but there is still there is still so much innovation that is required. We strongly believe that the future of insurance relies on effective collaboration between traditional firms and uh, insure techs and startups. Traditional firms need the, for digital agility and startups needs for scale up, or rather for scale, uh, compels mutual uh, beneficial partnerships. And as the startup uh, ecosystem orchestrator, we strongly support our clients 
continuous need for innovation. And I'll be proud to, to unveil the financial insurance challenge winners uh, later, later today. Um, the, the innovation you bring, I think, uh, as, a, as, a, uh, as an insurance tax to as low changing industry such as insurance is, is essential. Might not always be about challenging incumbents, but rather we see an increased focus on identifying profitable niches and acting as industry enablers. And, and from climate change to cyber, the future or, and to the future of embedded insurance, we need, the, the, the industry need uh, new ideas and, uh, and thoughts and the insure tech and, uh, and fintech are uh, uniquely placed to, to help in this journey. This is why the, the Capgemini Innovation Ecosystems brings together technology, a wide network of startups and proven methodology and services for uh, providing, uh, for driving tangible value. And in this journey to, uh, to unlock, uh, unlock innovation, uh, we have been collaborating with Chorus for a long time. Uh, in fact, the Chorus ability to bring together uh, valuable insights, use cases, and this active community uh, really complement our strategy. And I'm glad, um, uh, I'm glad we, we are continuing with this uh, collaboration. When we think at, uh, uh, at innovation uh, at, in, at Capgemini, this is for us a multi-pronged approach. This competition is one leg. Uh, uh, I mentioned earlier the Capgemini Ventures, where we aim for minority investments to help our clients forge a new path forward. And we invested in, in, in several tech over the last few years. And the other leg uh, of our approach our, is our innovation as a service methodology, where we help uh, our clients with an end-to-end -end approach from need diagnosis, scouting, partnerships, orchestration, and industrialization uh, delivered through, uh, through trusted partners. And, and how do we go about supporting our innovation as a service methodology? It is through what we call our scale-up programs, where we qualify InsurTech and FinTech through a series of interviews and um, interaction um, supplemented through a proprietary model, model and assess the maturity of a startup. We work closely with our ecosystems to bring uh, these, uh, these identified um, scale-ups uh, in, um, in front of our clients, but also to help them improve through ongoing feedback and recommendation based on our clients' feedback and our own expertise. So I hope you'll have a chance to enjoy today, today's uh, webinar, um, possibly join uh, our scale-up program if you're not already on it, and deepen the relationship uh, um, with, with us. And I wish the best of luck to all the finalists that uh, which we'll unveil later today. Uh, once again, uh, thanks uh, everyone, and I'll pass it back to you, Sarah, I guess. To take it uh, to take it forward. Thank you so much, Luca. Um, okay, so today we're going to kick off with our keynote speaker, Angelo De Rocco, Group Business Development Manager at Generale. Um, Angelo is Group Business Development and Partnerships Manager, and he's going to be speaking on the topic of from open banking to open insurance, opportunities and risks for insurers. Um, to our audience, if you have any questions uh, about, for Angelo um, as he's speaking, please do put them in the in the box on the side. And once Angelo has completed his presentation, I will I will ask them on your behalf. Um, Angelo, without further ado, over to you. Thank you very much, Sara. First of all, can you hear me well? I can definitely. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's uh, try to get right into the presentation. The goal of this presentation would be to. Um, to share with you basic knowledge about what open insurance is and what are the possibilities that this will unveil for the uh, for the whole sector. So uh, if we move to the next page, uh, let's start with some definition. So open insurance can be thought of as uh, the logical extension of the open banking. So we live in a world that uh, has had two big changes. First of all, regulation with the new uh, bills, I think in Europe as GDPR or PSD2 that uh, are putting the customers more and more in control of how the data is treated and, uh, how the, and who can access those data. And uh, on top of that, from a technological standpoint, we see the uh, rise of uh, APIs that can easily connect these firm players. So the first application for this has been open banking, you will know it. So the possibility for uh, banks and fintechs to access banking data of a partner, of uh, a customer, in order to uh, offer better and new services to the customers themselves. 
And the same logic can be applied also to other area of finance uh, and in this case of insurance. So we're talking about the possibility to share, obviously with prior consent of the customers, information about the policy, so the premium, the limits, the claims and so on, but probably also most importantly, the data uh, that are uh, uh, important for the underwriting. I'm thinking in this case of all the data uh, that we can gather through IoT devices. Uh, two examples in this case could be uh, on the motor side, the driving score, the driving behavior that can be gathered through black boxes or other devices that are out there at the moment. Or when we talk about wellness and health, uh, all the biomarkers that can be monitored nowadays pretty easily through our smartphones and smartwatch. And obviously, th this logic can be also brought one step further to a paradigm called uh, open data, where also other data related to maybe the interaction with retail player, healthcare players, utility players of a single person can be shared all with third parties, always with the final goal to provide better information. Uh, if we move to the next page, let's see uh, a potential theoretical application of open insurance. So in this case, we have uh, uh, a motor uh, insurer customer that wants to benchmark its policy uh, in order to see if there is better ones in the market. So the, through uh, open insurance, it can ask the it can ask the insurer insurer Ray that basically is the current insurer to share the, its information its information with a, a broker. The broker at the same time can pull up information on the available uh, data, available uh, covers, tailored on the risk profile specifically of the consumer from other players in the market, insurance B and insurer C. As a result, you can have the comparison, you can have also the recommendation. As third thing, you can also have the seamless uh, uh, switching uh, possibility for uh, the consumer to get basically to better cover and cheaper covers. So uh, if we move to the next page, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this change will impact uh, three types of stakeholder. So first of all, the insurer. Uh, as we've seen with banks, the insurer on one hand will have the compliance side of this change. So they will need to comply with the new regulation. The IT will be, need to be in place and uh, all the processes and the data sharing responsibility needs to be uh, well owned. But on the other hand, the insurer will also have the possibility to take advantage of this change, offering better and new services. It's uh, up to them. The consumer, once again, will be more in charge of its own control of uh, their data and uh, how they can use this. And uh, uh, basically, if they make good use of this opportunity, it will be for sure a plus for them. And then third, this is uh, very important, also for the supervisors, so the regulating authorities, this will represent an additional tool in order to improve their supervising capabilities as they can have, say, a nice look through on all the policy and all the portfolios of the companies. So uh, what are the benefits uh, uh, if we go to the next page? The benefits of this uh, of introduction are first of all, an increased transparency in the products that uh, first of all, will need to be standardized in order to be comparable in order to have data that can be easily transferred. And uh, uh, so it will uh, give the customer better choices. Uh, there will be, from a claim management perspective, for sure, a possibility to have a better understanding of uh, fraudulent act. Example, if a same claimant is claiming similar situation against two different uh, insurers, and it will uh, facilitate digital sales, let's say the embedded insurance type of movement that we see happening, but probably will need to have some boost. And finally, as I mentioned, uh, lastly, the, the emergence of new application for uh, the regulation world. But we need to be careful because there are also risks linked to that. First of all, we're talking about data, we call about data transmission. And so there is a data security and cyber uh, aspects to be taken care uh, of uh, very carefully as uh, the customers need to be 
certain and safe about uh, how the data is handled and who's able to access the data. Obviously, there is a, a concern and there are attention point regarding the way those data are used because it needs to be ethical and uh, in the best interest of the customer. And third, uh, financial exclusion. This is something that is a problem that pops up every time we have new sources of data that can be used for underwriting. So the risk here is that the, the visibility on the risk profile of the customer is too high that uh, a certain profile can be deemed too risky uh, not to have uh, covers offered by any player. Uh, this basically would go against the mutuality principle of the insurance business and would be uh, a sort of market failure that we want to avoid for sure. Uh, next page. Uh, as I said, this uh, new paradigm is still in the early stage and the adoption by regulators of regulation in that sense could be for sure an uh, important catalyst. We've seen some regulators moving uh, in this direction with the first case has been in Brazil. In 2021, uh, they adopted uh, a legislation specifically on open insurance that provides, first of all, a register of participants that are enabled to access the data, so participate in this exchange. They standardize the API uh, to transmit the data, and then they foresee also the inter interoperability with open banking in order for financial players to have a better view and provide better recommendation uh, toward the clients. Australia can be considered the second one that is uh, enhancing a regulation very similar to the GDPR in Europe, allowing the customer to be in control of the data and to transfer those data from one player to the other. Is starting from open banking, but now the next one to be uh, to be to be launched is uh, uh, is open insurance. And then in Europe we have AOPA. Uh, the regulator that is looking at the topic is launched uh, uh, a consultation mechanism and we expect that very soon we'll come up with some regulation. Uh, next page, uh, as we said, in the even if the regulation is not there yet, uh, at least uh, it's in uh, the first stage, first solutions uh, uh, are still to appear uh, in, uh, are already appearing in the market. An example is this Swedish uh, startup called Insurely that uh, uh, is providing uh, the technology for uh, insurer uh, to create uh, a solution to be compliant with uh, the open insurance uh, paradigm. A couple of use cases relevant for us could be the insurance manager. That is basically a wallet where uh, a customer can put all the information, no, I'm sorry, that can store automatically pulling the information from the, the various insurer of the various covers that the customer has. And second, the insurance, the insurance, insurance switcher that uh, basically is the step beyond uh, that, uh, the possibility to benchmark one cover against the other available in the market and to automatically uh, switch and basically change carrier. So basically to sum up, uh, last page, uh, the key points of uh, this brief intervention. Open insurance is the extension of open banking. So we move from sharing banking data to sharing insurance data. Uh, this change will have impact on various stakeholders. We said insurer, consumer, and also supervisor uh, of this world. And it will bring uh, for sure benefits, increased transparency, increased uh, competition, better sales process, but there will be risk to be carefully managed. Cyber risk, use of data, financial exclusion. Uh, Obviously, the regulation, the adoption of regulation in that sense will be catalyzer and we start to see some regulators go in that direction, but let's say we still uh, much way to go. Uh, I will stop here. I hope that uh, I fit into the time allotted and uh, Sarah, I'll give it to you. Thank you, Angelina. No, that was perfect timing. Um... We do, we do like it when presenters give us such fantastic insights, but in um, such a condensed uh, space of time. Um, did any of the audience have any questions? I haven't seen any come through on the chat. I have a couple of my own if there aren't. Okay, I'll go first. 
Um, I know you mentioned that there are a couple of, of risks, and I think we all know that there are risks involved with data, um, particularly when it's customer data and you're, you're moving it around and it's being shared. Um, is that is handling the data the biggest challenge for insurers, or is there something else? What is what is the biggest hurdle that insurers have to overcome in order to adopt open insurance? Uh, I, I think that this will be a catalyst for a lot of technological change because First of all, you need to enter into uh, a setting where you are able to transmit your information through API with third parties. And this is not always the case, especially when you have distribution that are agent-based, let's say they have a closed ecosystem. And it basically, it will require uh, be open to interact and to distribute to digital player. Basically, I expect that uh, companies that are more advanced in the embedded uh, insurance type of distribution will be uh, basically favor, will be, let's say, uh, high ed in the adoption of this. And then, uh, as I said, uh, the cyber risk, the data protection is always something that uh, needs to be careful of because uh, the risks are there, the risks are increasing, and sometimes they are unknown. And so, uh, and there is a lot of stake. I think, you know, of the risk for the GDPR, the of penalty up to 4% of the worldwide revenues, at least in Europe. This is something very material. Yes, you don't want to get it wrong because the regulators no. aren't going <laughs> aren't no. to let it go. <laughs> um, so we have had a, a, quest, a question from the audience come in, um, which is how willing are insurance companies to share data given it's one of their key assets? <laughs> Nice question. Nice, yeah. <laughs> nice question. So um, I would say probably the the insurer would prefer not to share a lot of data because, uh, as, as you said, this is the, the key data. But these changes uh, are pushed by the regulator. Yeah. Uh, as we said. So you and, have to. Uh, and I expect also that there will be uh, a lot of. Um, push back and forth on the type of data that can be shared. Because as long as you have standardized information on the policy and on the covers, maybe this is something that, uh, okay, it's uh, pertaining to, uh, to the customer. When it's about maybe additional information uh, regarding the underwriting, the second set that I said, uh, the, what you can get through IoT system, it's, uh, a bit uh, more complicated but in the end we need to remind that the, the regulation worldwide is going now toward the fact uh, of recognizing the ownership of the, the data to the customers so it's not uh, insurer uh, sharing their data my insuring allowing the customer to transfer transmit the data of the customer from one insurer to the other so we've got lots of questions now that I've said that. So I will wow. just pick one in front of me because I'm sure we can have this conversation all day, but we do want to get on to announcing some winners. Um, so I'll just pick this one, which says, um, do you think that open insurance will be a catalyst for more insurance products to be embedded in client journeys across industries such as travel and online shopping? I think so for the reason that I mentioned to you in the first place, basically, when you have to comply with open bank, you need to be API ready. So you need to have technology that allows you to transmit information and to interact with third parties. Once you have that, uh, I believe that uh, the, the ability to uh, distribute through third parties, so in, in technological speaking, to interact uh, uh, with the third party IT system will be, uh, will be much easier, will be, Mm -hmm. would be there yeah and as you said i think the important one of the key things here is that insurers need to get their technology stacks in order before they can do any of these things but there's a lot of technology and a lot of insurers is quite aged um yes. so to all of the, those uh, people whose questions weren't answered we will collate them and see if we can get some answers um over to you later um but for now angelo thank you very much don't go anywhere because i will be calling on you in just a second <laughs> okay um but now we're going to move on to the heart of today's event which is the new tech challenge as I mentioned, this is the second challenge we've run as the open finance community, and we were looking for insure techs that are innovators and pioneers in the use of open finance, connectivity and data, all key elements in the development of open finance. Uh, so the process that we went through here 
um, was that we had um, all the submissions came to us. We then they were put in front of um, a jury that we had a jury of um, insurance peers, some, some really, really impressive names on our, on our jury, um, including some you've already seen today and some you'll see a bit later on. Um, there was an independent, there was a thorough judging process, and we also had a public vote in there as well. So we weren't just voting for our personal favourites. We did um, have some public votes that come in, but the uh, the votes were weighted um, in favour of our insurance experts. Um, so that was the process. Um, I will hand over to Angelo to announce the bronze winner today. Oh, sorry, I should mention that these were our, um, because we only have three winners today, I should mention that these were our seven finalists. Apologies, Angelo, now over to you. <laughs> Okay, so thank you. I'm very pleased to announce that the bronze award goes to Sonar. So thank you very much, Angelo. Is there somebody from Sonar who would like to join us and, and say a few words? There is. Hi. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? That's probably the first question. Yes, I can hear you loud and clear. So hopefully that means everybody else can. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, well, seconds less of a less of a question, more of a statement. But thank you. Um, you know, uh, awards are always a good thing, right? But um, as you as you mentioned, Sarah, you know, when they come from uh, when they're based on the uh, independent review from your insurance peers, uh, many of which <laughs> constitute our, our our customers and, and friends, too, then, you know, that's the, that's all the more encouraging. Um, so, yeah, just a, a massive thank you uh, from everyone at Sonar. Uh, we work really hard to, uh, to to try and appear innovative and help the insurance and reinsurance community to understand what innovation looks like uh, on a global basis. And so to have any sort of recognition uh, for that is, is wonderful. So thank you again. Um, much appreciated. Thank you so much for joining us, Matt, and congratulations. Thank you very much, Angelo. OK, so now we're going to move on to our next speaker. Uh, that is someone who has a great deal of expertise in the world of insurance innovation. He ran the lab at Lloyd's of London for a number of years before going on to co-found an innovation broker. I will leave him to explain exactly what an innovation broker is, but uh, for now, please welcome Ed Gaze from Innovative Risk Labs to talk about insurance innovation, a plea from the front lines. Ed, over to you. Thanks, Sarah. <clears throat> right, guys, let me tell you a story. Um, when I joined the world of insurance back in 2018, I had no clue what I was letting myself in for. I had no idea what an MGA was and why the hell would I? Um, I also didn't know what DNO meant what an A&H underwriter did, and I certainly didn't know what property fact was. To me, a border row was French for slip, whereas a slip was normally followed by a sore bottom. Capacity meant the amount of time I had to spare to spend on new clients, because I was a management consultant before that, after all. If you talked about a carrier, I thought of pigeons, or maybe a carrier bag, or because I'm an engineer, sometimes I thought aircraft carrier. A syndicate was a group of criminals, or more, perhaps more aptly, a group of people gambling on the lottery together. And an endorsement meant somebody's talking you up. A treaty was some kind of intergovernmental agreement on taxes, and full stack surely refers to a developer who works on the back and front end. Like I say, I didn't know what an MGA was, but I was pretty sure it meant for managing general agents and as it was a general agent, it was probably more important than a managing agent. So I was pretty happy with myself about that one. So then things started to get a bit more confusing. Um, I heard these people talking about things like cover holders and MGUs. And I was like, well, what the hell are these things? Um, but fear not, uh, I used my newbie status in the market to ask lots of questions. The problem is I never got the same answer twice. I mean, didn't these people know what they were talking about? Well, then things got funnier still. So as Sarah said, I opened and ran the Lloyd's Lab for the first four years. And the first cohort, we're halfway through and we did this thing called the Midpoint Review, which is where we get the insure techs and mentors together and see how their progress is going and things like that. So I remember this one instance with this insure tech where we had this meeting and I mean, the guy sounded smart, no doubt, but I didn't have a clue what he was talking about. So um, we had a separate session with one of the mentors. This guy was a veteran from the market, seemed to know the score. So I say to this guy, I was like, look, I gotta be honest, I don't get what this insure tech is doing. But before I could finish the sentence, he jumped in and said, me neither. 
So um, that was when I realized that it wasn't perhaps just me that didn't know what everyone else was talking about. So what's the point in this little story um, other than showing myself up? Um, and apologies if the, uh, you know, there's people from different countries here uh, and I'm not sure how well these things translate, but I thought that might, get, might make it even more fun because you're trying to figure out what a slip is or what a, uh, all these different things mean in, uh, in your languages. So anyway, the point of the story is if you're new to the market and you're trying to disrupt insurance from the outside, like many do, you probably think the same things as me when you hear some of these terms. But to those of us like me now, who are well ingrained in sure speak, you'll know otherwise. And I think this is a genuine, a genuine problem for insurance and innovation in our market. And basically I'm here to beg that you speak plain English, German, French, Italian, whatever it might be, whenever you can, when you're working with newbie insure techs. When you ask someone for like, what are the biggest challenges uh, or biggest barriers to innovation in the insurance market, often hear like things like data, as we heard earlier, fresh talent, distribution, regulation, capacity. Um, they're definitely big, big things uh, that are barriers and challenges. But I guess in this small talk I've been um, gifted for this session, I want to talk about three things I think are more manageable barriers that we can help knock down to improve um, and make it easier for InsurTechs to innovate. There are things that can make a big difference. So you get the point that the first one is insure speak. It's top of the list for me. And it's because I keep on coming across it in my, in my role. But I just went one more final point on the insure speak bit. Okay, yes, anyone who wants to create an MGA should really know what one is. But why th make things more difficult than they should be or they need to be? Why use language that can confuse people, particularly people who are like new to the market? Like for those who are, British among us, um, and maybe there's similarities in other languages, but like when I did GCC French, you know, I could follow somebody telling me how many brothers and sisters they got, and they've got a garden and a dog or a cat. Uh, I could do that, but it, I had to think about it a bit, and it set me back and slowed me down in the conversation in, than it would if they said it in English. And it's kind of similar for insurtechs when they're getting into insurance. All these words, they can kind of eventually get to know what they mean, but it sets them back in the conversation, puts them on the back foot. It means they're not as sharp in asking the most challenging question they should be asking next. Another thing to remember is it's not just about the, the actual language itself, but that coupled with, um, well, I mean, the language itself, like I said before, I was a management consultant before, so I've been in lots of clients where they all have their own acronyms and words, and you do learn to deal with it. But with insurance, is that combined with the fact that the business model is not obvious. Quite a few of the insurance techs I've worked with are brand new to insurance, and they don't really get how an MJ fits in. I mean, why would they? Everyone can figure out how a retail business or a manufacturing business works, but there's no actual guides on how to set up an insure tech startup. And, you know, for those that are setting up MGAs, you know, brokers and stuff, it's difficult. For those that are creating data solutions and things, it's difficult for them too, because they don't know exactly how they fit in or who they should be targeting. So please speak plain English, French, German, Italian, um, especially with those who are new to the market. So well, I promised three things. I think I might have promised three things, but I'm going to give you three things. Um, first one, ensure speak. Second one, avoid the slow no. You do realize how painful it is for startups and innovators, right? They're putting loads of time in, into everything they can do to make, uh, to impress you, you know, to, to um, make your life easy and to hope that you're pushing their initiative forward uh, for them internally in your business if you're an incumbent. The slow no is really disrespectful. It stops them from focusing their efforts elsewhere. And ultimately, they've limited runway sometimes. So it can be like, you know, pretty, pretty, pretty bad for an insure tech if they're wasting all this time and actually never going to get anywhere with it. Several of the insure techs I've worked with, as I've said before, are new to insurance. Um, and they don't get they don't get how slow insurance is, right? Uh, and I have to manage their expectations, but they always think they always think they're going to be different. I oh, know we'll get it done in three months or whatever it might be. It's just it's not going to happen. You know, it is slow. Slow no is the worst, but it's slow generally. We know that. Um, in fact, I had one insurtech founder who said to me that um, 
uh, if he'd have known what a pain in the ass insurance would be, he would never have got into InsurTech. Uh, and I could feel his pain. Um, but like, I, I, I mean, from my side, I tr tried to do what I can. I had an insurer recently that we're working with and um, it's kind of an exclusive arrangement at the moment uh, or at the time when this happened anyway. And you're doing what you can. We get to a point, everything's going really well. And then we're going to set up a follow-up meeting. Follow-up meeting goes in the calendar. And I realized the date is like, not like a few days time, but a month from now. And I'm like, what the hell? Um, so a quick challenge is like, does it really need to be, to be a month from now? And all of a sudden it moves a week and a bit closer. It's like, that wasn't hard, was it? Um, but it's just easy for them to kick the can down the road, to always push the meetings back. And that just loses momentum. And ultimately, if you've not got that momentum, it's easier to kind of, forget the reason you started doing this in the first place. It's, it, it means you're not really driving it forward and you're more likely to end up with a no. Um, so, you know, just ask you, take a look, long, hard look at the initiatives you're nurturing. And if you know deep down it ain't gonna happen, then let them know, let them know why, if they can change that and let them decide where they should spend their time. So we've got in short speak, the slow no. Third one I'm gonna do is, startup onboarding. Like we all know those like 50 page IT onboarding questionnaires that asking a fully remote SaaS two person startup questions that IBM would get irritated having to answer. You know, we've seen this quite a bit. Um, one of the Lloyd's Lab startups um, went through the program, had months of relationship they were building. It's just like a few people um, and working on a data solution and um, then it came to onboarding and like one of them had to spend almost two weeks working on it. There were so many questions, there were policies, there were all these things they had to go through. They didn't know the answer to some questions, whereas really they'd just go NA, you know, but they don't know that and they're trying to be really diligent. They just suck so much of their time and life out of them. Um, the other things that, uh, with the onboarding is like, you know, slow replies, as I said earlier, lack of internal coordination, at no single point of contact. Uh, it just makes everything opaque and frustrating. So while I was at Lloyds of London, I helped them on board um, or, or take on the FinTech pledge, pledge, which was set up by Tech Nation, RIP. Um, and basically I hope that although Tech Nation is no longer what it was, the FinTech pledge will outlast its creator. And that some of you that are from incumbent insurers, if you're not already signed up to it, you go away, look at the principles and try and embed those in your organizations. So that's it. Those are my three pleas from the front line of insurance innovation. Please take heed and help a new generation of insurtechs get going, launch and transform our industry. So I'm Ed Gaze. I run IRL, Innovative Risk Labs. We're an insurtech broker. We're not really insurtech ourselves, but we help insurtechs. Uh, we're based in the UK. We're very soon to be a Lloyds broker and we'll be the only Lloyds broker dedicated to InsureTech. So if, um, if you want to talk to us, you know where to find us. Um, thanks for uh, listening to my rant about the challenges for InsureTech getting into the market. Cheers. Thank you so much, Ed. Um, I, there's a lot, um, a lot of food for thought there. I appreciated your, your linguistic puns um, and I'm sure other people did as well. Um, do we have any questions from the audience for Ed? I mean, there's a, there's a lot to think about there, I think, both from the perspective of InsurTechs, um, many of whom I think who have joined us will completely understand what you're talking about and understand your pain, and perhaps also from, uh, from the insurers present who maybe there's some food for thought there about how if they're looking to engage with InsurTechs, they can, um, they can change their own processes or they can rethink how they have a go about those engagements. Um, so don't... I can't see any now, but this happened last time. I asked a question and then everybody else piled in. Um, so I will um, start out and say, what, how come you didn't, how come you didn't give up, Ed? Like in the midst of all this kind of, what, what is it about insurance that's kept you in the industry, that's kept you kind of loving it and wanting to go on and support more insure techs now? Because I completely see what you're saying, the pain that you can feel from <laughs> all these different angles when coming into this industry. Um, what, what is it about it that you actually love that keeps you going? Well, I, I will be open. In 2018, I did not think insurance was interesting. <laughs> the only reason I took the lab role is because I'd been to Lloyd's building and it, it was like the history and the tradition I loved. Um, and I thought the idea of like 
setting the catamug and the pigeons in uh, in the insurance industry and bringing Shortex in to change stuff. I thought that'd be fun and really interesting. So did it, but fell in love with it very quickly because although it's slow, um, it just covers everything. You know, one moment I'll be talking about IVF, another moment I'll be talking about like cargo and forced labor, uh, slave labor. Another moment I'm talking about, um, you know, art. And it's just like my, you know, my days even back then and now are just so mixed with different things. And what I really love is that you meet people who come to you uh, in, in my kind of role, you know, come to you explaining a problem that people are facing in the world that can cause, you know, real problems, uh, real issues with people, and then giving a solution to it. And um, basically, I just get real satisfaction from helping create solutions to problems pe people are facing. And what one thing that really surprised me um, was that although I thought the Lloyd's Market and insurers would all be competing, they do compete. But when it comes to innovation, there's so much collaboration. And it's really inspiring to see how people come together to work together from different organizations to create new solutions. And, um, you know, I, I think that's that's one of the, the fascinating things about Lloyd of London. For people who haven't visited the Lloyd's of London building, please, by the way, try and get yourself in there. Ed very kindly gave me a tour a few years ago, and it really is one of the most fascinating places I've ever been, and particularly as a lover of history. Um, well, thank you very much, Ed. Um, don't disappear, though, because I would like you, if you would, to announce our silver winner as part of our new tech challenge. I will just let Paul Merker sort the slides out because... Uh, or as, as always with these things, I always say it wouldn't be a tech challenge if tech didn't get in the way somehow. Um, Nurka, are we ready to move on to the silver announcement? There we go. OK, Ed, over to you. Awesome. Delighted to announce that the winner of the silver award is Dakadu. So do we have somebody from Dakadu who'd like to say a few words on the call? We do. Somebody's appeared. Oh, no, they've disappeared. <laughs> Changed their mind. There we go. We do have somebody. Perfect. OK. Joss, I think you're muted if you just... Yes, now Perfect. I had to find the button how to mute myself. Good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for, for this uh, wonderful surprise. Uh, for those of you that do not know Decadu, we're a Swiss insure tech and health tech company. We were founded in 2010 in, in Switzerland. Uh, we have got uh, clients across the globe, uh, primarily insurance companies, but meanwhile, we're also expanding into banks, retailers, and telephone companies, and our offerings primarily digital health engagement uh, platforms, as well as scoring mechanisms for uh, health uh, risk, to quantify health and to quantify mortality risk. So thank you very much for that. It's a, it's a wonderful surprise. That's my turn to find the mute button. Congratulations to you. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. Um, so now we're going to move on to our final panelist, um, our final speaker, I should say, um, who unfortunately couldn't be with us today, but he has sent us a presentation, which we're going to watch. Uh, so Marshan Kushab, the Director of Innovation at PZU, um, will deliver a presentation, a pre-recorded presentation that we will watch. And then his colleague, Anna, has very kindly agreed to join us live and in person afterwards to answer any questions you might have about PZU's um, innovation efforts. Okay, okay, let's roll that video. Good morning to everyone. Uh, my name is Marcin Kurczab and I'm a head of Innovation Lab at PZU Group. Uh, today, during my presentation, I would like to share with you a short story on how PZU Group is innovating uh, in the insurter area. Uh, especially, I would like to uh, share with you three main lessons that we uh, had during the time uh, of running our PZU Ready for Startups uh, program. Uh, so uh, hello once again, and also big thanks to uh, Chorus team for having us uh, here today. Uh, at the beginning, I would like to introduce uh, PCTU Group to those of you who may not be familiar with uh, what we are doing. Uh, so PCTU is the largest financial institution uh, in Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, we have uh, approximately 22 million uh, customers in five countries. Uh, we run uh, insurance business, but also uh, we are an owner of two major banks uh, in Poland. So how do you innovate in an insurance uh, company that is operating in a, a conservative sector, that is uh, highly regulated? Uh, how do you do that? 
uh, we asked uh, ourselves such a question five, six years ago when we are considering uh, running a special team of people of, of uh, founding Innovation Lab at, at BZU. And we decided that in order to test and implement uh, innovative solutions effectively, you uh, have to have a little bit uh, different mindset, different approach than it is uh, typical for an uh, insurance company. Uh, you have to be uh, uh, open uh, to, to experiment. You have to be open and allow uh, to, to fail sometimes in your projects. And that is why we, uh, we run our innovation in a, a little bit garage uh, approach, garage mindset. Uh, and the first lesson that we uh, have uh, for the five, six years of running our uh, PZ Ready for Startup uh, program is that you have to be very precise uh, in answering to, to the question that you see. So why do we do that? Uh, at PZU, we uh, say that we uh, run our projects in order to uh, improve our business, to improve our business-oriented KPIs, uh, and this is our uh, main goal. Uh, we are not interested in PR projects, we are not uh, interested in uh, testing technology only to test technology, so we treat uh, innovation um, that it is uh, a mean to an end, not uh, an end uh, in itself. Yeah. So that, that's our first lesson, first uh, takeaway that I would like to share with you today. The second thing is uh, connected with uh, selectivity. So as you uh, probably know, there are hundreds or even thousands of uh, startups that uh, can provide you with solutions that can uh, optimize your business. And uh, it's very important to, um, to know what you want to do and also know what you don't want to do. Mm, at PCTU Group, we have uh, four major uh, areas that uh, we are uh, we are like looking for in terms of uh, innovation innovations, uh, and uh, we are very selective in terms of picking the startups, picking the partners that we are uh, running projects with. So we have one percent rule, which means that. Uh, we have to analyze around uh, 100 startups in order to pick one to to do a project with uh, with it with with the team. Uh, so after running our uh, PZU Ready for Startups uh, program for the five last years, we managed to analyze uh, roughly 5,000 different uh, ideas, uh, projects, startups for uh, for innovations uh, at PCTU. Uh, we ran uh, around 60 uh, pilot projects and uh, because of the success rate of around uh, 60%, 65%, uh, we managed to implement uh, around 40 different uh, innovative projects uh, in PZ2 Group together with uh, with startups. Yeah? So we work not only with uh, Polish startups, we are also open to cooperate with uh, abroad startups. Um, and we are ready to cooperate both uh, with a very early stage startups uh, for which we have a dedicated acceleration and mentoring program. Uh, for well-established startups uh, who do not need uh, acceleration, uh, we have a um, dedicated innovation uh, process at PZU Group, which enable us to test and implement in a, in a very efficient way. Uh, the last lesson um, that I would like to, to share with you today is that uh, when you have a good business case uh, for, for innovation, you have an appropriate partner, appropriate startup to, to make a project with. Um, what is really important uh, to be highly successful is to have a very good execution. So. Uh, at the end of the day, I saw a lot of uh, well looking projects on the slide and uh, really not uh, well operating teams or um, like um, execution of technology can also be a, a nightmare sometimes. So uh, 
hands-on approach and uh, high mindset towards achieving your goal, good execution is uh, crucial in my uh, opinion. And wh what are some examples of the projects that we, uh, we've done uh, at PZU so far together with startups? Um, the first project is connected with uh, motor claims handling. Uh, PZU was one of the very first insurance companies in Europe to test and implement this technology. Right now it is uh, implemented in almost every uh, motor claim scenario that we have at PZU Group. Uh, so far, uh, AI helped us to uh, to analyze the claims that are worth more than 1 billion euros. Uh, and uh, we believe that this technology is really game changing technology. It uh, helps uh, us to, to run our business more efficiently, um, especially in terms of time to market um, of, of serving our customer but also to, to some business oriented uh, KPIs. And what is really great is also that uh, customer really value the process. Yeah? So, so the um, NPS is uh, very high uh, in this uh, self-service process uh, in PZU. Uh, the second case that I would like to share with you today is uh, related to open insurance uh, approach. Uh, and this is the project that we've done together with uh, one of our banks, uh, PKOSA Bank is the second largest bank in Poland. Uh, and uh, this project is connected, uh, related to, to motor insurance uh, product. Uh, what we've done here is that we shorten the customer journey uh, of having a quotation of, of um, insurance products. So, Typically, in, on the Polish market, you have to provide the uh, insurance company with uh, around 20 different uh, data points, 20 different uh, variables in order to have a quotation. And here, uh, because of uh, combining uh, PZU database, banking database, and also uh, some external databases, we were managed. Uh, we managed to to shorten this uh, this number to to cut this number to only one uh, single variable that uh, our customer has to provide us in order to have a quotation. It has a really high impact on the customer NPS and also helps uh, in terms of uh, conversion um, when, when speaking to to the motor uh, product. Mm. The last example that I would like to share is uh, related to a very important mission that we uh, as a insurance uh, companies uh, have. Um, what I mean is that uh, we don't treat insurance products as um, only financial products. Uh, we uh, at PCTU Group uh, invest a lot uh, of our effort in order to, uh, to be really efficient and to help our customers when they are in need. Um, so we have a kind of a superhero uh, approach uh, in, in PCTU. And the, the project that I would uh, tell you about uh, is called uh, Before You Call Service. And, uh, in this project, uh, we use new technologies in order to monitor uh, external data points, uh, external uh, information portals. And if there is a high probability that uh, a customer uh, of PZU Group uh, may be hurt or something bad is happening to, to him, to she, uh, we proactively contact with this customer. Yeah? So, Mm, we phone to our customers, we ask them if they are fine, uh, we provide them with the first uh, assistance uh, that they need in this, uh, in this uh, hard time uh, for them. And uh, this project is mainly not really game-changing process, in, in pro project in terms of uh, business uh, KPIs, but it is really nice way of, uh, of helping your customers in this moment of truth uh, that I believe. So thank you very much for, for having uh, us today. Uh, I leave you uh, in a good hands of uh, Anna Kościuczuk uh, from my team and we are happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much. Have a good day.
Hi, apologies, everybody. My internet went down, so <laughs> I'm back now. Um, Anna, lovely to have you with us. Um, I don't know if anybody's got as far as asking you any questions yet. Have Have you had any audience no. questions? We have one question. I think I tried to answer it during my uh, short, uh, short uh, introduction. Uh, so good morning, everyone. I'm uh, Anna. I'm working together with uh, Marcin. Uh, we are representing uh, Innovation Lab. Hope hope you liked uh, Marcin' uh, presentation and you get some uh, uh, interesting insights uh, from it. Uh, if you uh, if you want to learn more what we are doing, how we cooperate uh, with startups, I encourage you to, to ask questions during this uh, short five minute session or, or you can also contact me via LinkedIn uh, after, after this session. Okay, we have a specific no uh, questions, so I try to address the, both of them. Uh, so the first question, okay, I will see. So the first question was uh, if we use, uh, uh, if we in open insurance uh, projects, do you use the data from public, governmental or uh, proprietary sources? So it depends on the project, but uh, in this project, which uh, Martin showed, so the second one, quick quotation for motor insurance, we use, uh, two sources of uh, official governmental organizations uh, and uh, one source is a uh, um, private company. So, but uh, um, to, to start the process, uh, governmental sources are more crucial ones. Uh, that's, that's why we focus on uh, governmental sources. So that is the specific answer to the first question. And the uh, second question, do you have any examples of uh, COOP and L and H area? Uh, actually, I don't uh, understand the question. <laughs> do you want me to translate that? That's very, yeah. <laughs> that's a very English um, kind of a shortening. Do you have any examples of cooperation um, in the life and health area, I believe is, is the question that's being asked. Mm, examples of uh, cooperation, but uh, you mean in a field of uh, open insurance or general? Um, I would go with with either. I mean, that I think either would be of interest because I think any partnerships and any kind of uh, you know engagement with other parties when you're we're an insurer is always of interest to people. Mm. Actually, we uh, we have uh, um, some examples of cooperation near the life and health areas, like for example, uh, life band uh, for our um, customers. Uh, so this is solution which uh, uh, prevents their uh, life. So we try to help them. Uh, um, during uh, during emergency cases when something bad uh, happens, so uh, they received this uh, this kind of IoT solution. And right now we have uh, um, skin uh, cancer preventing app. So it's called uh, in Polish market minute one minute for skin. And thanks to that solution. It's also a preventing program. Uh, thanks to that solution, our clients can scan their skin and they uh, receive information if there is a chance and probability of having skin cancer and if they should uh, contact the doctor or if everything is okay. So that is a specific uh, answer. If you are interested in our projects, we have... Uh, 18 of them described on our website, pzu.pl slash innovation. And, but most of them is uh, from uh, mm, like, uh, mm, not from life and health uh, area. Uh, how, 
yes. Uh, how many employees are then in your innovation lab? So we have uh, right now 10 employers. We start with uh, five people. And during uh, five years, uh, almost uh, for, for the whole, uh, or almost in each year, we have uh, 10 people uh, in the innovation lab. Uh, do you have any examples of cooperation? Ah, okay, so that was yeah. the, the it, question. It, the questions are kind of uh, come in both channels. Um, so I think uh, I think we've addressed. Okay, so yeah, there we go. Yes. Okay, maybe uh, I try to be very specific with your uh, questions. So if you want to uh, ask something more, then I mean, please I, feel I, free. I, I, I have one that, that relates, I think, um, to anybody who's working in open insurance or with customer data. If you're asking customers to share their data with you as part of the quote process, uh, which I know PZU does, how do you make sure they're comfortable sharing their data with you at that point? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we try to be very transparent and so we uh, we inform our clients on the sales uh, application uh, uh, about the process and from what parts we have their data. So from what participants of their market we receive the data. So clients have always, uh, always the, the, the information and they can contact us, they can ask us Mm, so we try to be transparent. That is uh, mm, that is our approach, uh, and we our market is of course uh, highly regulated. So um, so we uh, uh, send only send and receive the data which we can uh, receive or send. Yes, I think that's that's completely part of the point, isn't it? You have to be honest and open about what data you're using, why you're using it, you know, and, and, and what you're, what you're going to do with it to make people happy to share it. Um, I don't think we have any further questions. So thank you so much for joining us, Anna. I really appreciate it um, that you, you stepped in at the last minute there. Um, we thank you very much. Thank you. And, and I, I would say to anybody who's listening, if you have further questions that we didn't get to today, I think all three of our speakers are, are happy to be contacted via LinkedIn if you have anything else. So do, do feel free to reach out to them. Um, right. Now we're going to move on to the main event. We are going to talk. Uh, we're going to announce the winner of our gold award. Um, and to do this, I would like to invite Luca back. So, Luca, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um... Can you hear me all right? Yes, I think so. Uh, good. So yes, it's a it's a pleasure to, to be to be back for this uh, important announcement, um, and uh, it's a pleasure to announce the gold winner of this competition, which is Zing. Uh, Zing is a fast scaling insure tech embedded at the e-commerce checkout of leading and retail brands. So I'll pass it over to to the Zing team. Do we have anyone from Zing? We do. They're just appearing. There we go. Over to you, Matt. Hello. Hi. To you. Hi there. I'm Matt Nunny. I'm the CTO and co-founder of Zing. Um, well, first of all, thanks so much. Absolutely uh, blown away. This is fantastic news. Um, really exciting. Um, for those of you who don't know, um, Zing Cover is a business focused on embedded insurance um, ultimately, we've created both uh, innovative technologies and insurance products to help our partners uh, offer uh, accessible and relevant and transparent insurance within their platforms. Um, and I guess, you know, the, the thing that ultimately we believe in and we are trying to do is, is to enable consumers to buy the insurance they need when they need it and when it's most relevant to them and get the insurance products that are right for them. And that's really what is the focus for our business. And, uh, you know, the technology and the innovation springs from that. And there's obviously innovation both in the technology and the insurance products that we are creating to enable that to happen. Um, our job ultimately is to make all of this look super simple and super easy, uh, both for our partners and for the consumers. And 
as all the speakers have touched on today, and as we all know that it's it's not very easy. There's an incredible amount of complexity that sits behind this and an incredible amount of work that goes into making this happen. So um, really made up to get this award, really uh, super happy. Um, and it's great for the team that all of our hard work is uh, being recognized, not only with us progressing with achieving our business goals, but you know, getting the recognition from the industry as well. So thank you very much. Uh, just really happy and, and, and thanks, it's fantastic. Thank you very much, Matt. Congratulations, we're pleased to have made your day. No, that's, that's awesome, you really have. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, um, thank you so much. Um, it falls to me to just wrap up today's ceremony. Um, thank you so much to all our speakers. Um, as I mentioned, I'm sure all of them are happy to answer any further questions you might have. So do feel free to reach out to them on LinkedIn. Um, if people ask questions and they weren't answered, we will try and, and find a way to, to get you responses um, to those. Um, congratulations to all our winners, obviously. So as I mentioned earlier, we would love to know if you enjoyed today's event. Um, if you have any um, feedback for us, please do um, send it over to, to um, the organizers of the event, to Chorus. Um, we'd be more than happy to hear what you have to say and incorporate it into our next event, which will be coming soon. Um, please do keep your eyes peeled for what our next focus areas will be. So we started with payments. Obviously, today was um, a celebration of InsureTech, and there will be a third uh, ceremony coming soon. Um, please do join our online finance community if you haven't already. Uh, if you don't know how to do that, please do reach out to Elena. Her details are on the screen there and she can help you sign up. Um, it's a really good platform. You can find content. You can connect with startups, other insurers, um, technology providers, um, collaborate with each other, You know, participate in more events like this. Um, and perhaps more excitingly, although maybe I shouldn't say that, you can join us in person. So we, Chorus, are hosting a three-day event in Milan in June. Um, one day will focus exclusively on insurance, the first day. Um, so do look up the details for that um, on the Chorus website. We would love to have you along. Um, who doesn't want to go to Milan for a couple of days in June? Uh, I hear the food is very good. That's why I'm going. Um, and as I said, one day will be entirely focused on insurance, and we will follow up on some of the, the topics that have been touched on and addressed today. <laughs> 